Oh, and you <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I'm so thrilled to see so many people here and excited for Maria to give her talk today. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Women's History Month. Uh, we still have more events happening. Um, Tomorrow, uh, myself and Sophie Peak, postdoc, with myself and Caleb, will be doing a presentation on eDNA and the work that we're doing with using eDNA in the Amazon. So stop by or send notes to your networks to come and check it out. There's also, I think Sarah's is the following week, Sarah Juan, um, will be doing a Science Hub think from an anaconda shed that's coming over from the shed aquarium. Anyway, uh, check out some more events. If you use social media, please tag uh, Women in Science, Women's History Month at the Field Museum uh, so we can get some support and word out there. Um, with that, I'll go ahead and start and introduce our speaker for today. Maria Valdez obtained her bachelor's in geophysical sciences from the University of Chicago. As an undergraduate student, she interned in the Robert A. Pritzker Center for Meteoritics and Polar Studies and helped organize and integrate recently acquired meteorite collections. From Chicago, she started working on calcium isotopes at the University of Washington in St. Louis for her master's degree to better understand Earth's building blocks. For her PhD in Brussels, she continued working on calcium isotopes and by now is one of the world's experts on this topic and has authored a comprehensive review paper on this topic. After a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of Cambridge, she moved back to Chicago and the Field Museum in 2019 as the John Caldwell Meeker Postdoctoral Fellow. She's now a research scientist at the Robert A. Pritzker Center and studies the planet Mars, asteroid Vesta, and other asteroids with meteorites and micrometeorites. So pleased to welcome Maria Valdez. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. Thank you so much, Leslie, for that um, uh, introduction. Um, today, I'm gonna talk about my work using meteorites to study the origin and evolution of the solar system um, and my recent work in Antarctica. Last week, I had a table set up in the science hub upstairs um, and by the end of the session, I had a pretty well rehearsed five minute spiel that I was giving everyone. Um, I was going over the histories and the similarities and the differences of all these materials on the table. And then this particularly inquisitive kid out of nowhere asked me, uh, yeah, but why do you do any of this? And I was like, yeah, okay, kid, that's, that's a really valid question. Um, well done. Um, and if I'm honest, it's one that I often find myself wondering about my own colleagues here, and I'm, and I'm sure you all do too. So instead of giving you a science heavy lecture, I wanna focus on the why and uh, the neat adventures that the why sometimes takes me to. Uh, so here at the museum, I consider myself a cosmochemist. Uh, cosmochemistry by its broadest definition is the study of the chemical composition of matter in the universe and the processes that led to these compositions. The term cosmochemistry is modern in its origin. Um, the science can be traced back about 200 years to the time when for the first time scientists realized that they were analyzing pieces of extraterrestrial matter. Cosmochemistry encompasses the study of the compositions of uh, the, our solar system sun, the planets and their satellites, the many asteroids in the asteroid belt and beyond, comets, and all of the dust in between. And the overarching goal is to understand how we went from a vast molecular cloud of hydrogen and helium and dust and with contributions from various stellar sources 4.6 billion years ago to the solar system as we know it today. Astrophysicists and modelers have given us a really good story to work with. And so the running story right now is that the solar system began with the collapse of a molecular cloud. And this may have been uh, induced by shock waves of a, of a neighboring supernova. 
and the resulting increase in angular momentum formed a rotating disk, which we call a protoplanetary disk, um, nested inside the molecular cloud. At the center of the protoplanetary disk, uh, a protosun began hydrogen fusion once sufficiently high temperatures and pressures were achieved. And meanwhile, the remaining gas and dust material spread out, uh, and over time, planets grew out of the protoplanetary disk via accretion, whereby micrometer-sized solid particles coalesced into centimeter-sized pebbles, and those coalesced into uh, kilometer-sized planetesimals, and those coalesced into planets. Any material that did not accrete into planets or their satellites remains to this day uh, in the solar system as asteroids, mostly in the main asteroid belts between uh, the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. So how has this story been supported by chemical evidence? What kinds of samples uh, do we have available to us? There are, of course, um, sample return missions, such as the Apollo missions, which returned several hundred kilos of uh, lunar material, and the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover that's currently exploring Jezero Crater. Um, but these are rare and expensive, and uh, although they do provide some really important um, types of information, specifically about context, about extraterrestrial material, they're, they're rare. So for the most part, we obtain extraterrestrial samples from material that falls to Earth on its own accord. Meteorites, oops, meteorites are fragments of asteroids that collide and break up in the asteroid belt, sending about two tons of material to Earth every year. Um, I should say not all meteorites come from asteroids. Uh, a small fraction are known to come from the moon and some do come from Mars. There are also micrometeorites uh, these are cosmic dust particles or interplanetary dust particles, and these are any meteorites that are less than two millimeters in diameter. Um, they actually make up the largest portion by far of extraterrestrial material that falls to Earth. About 47,000 tons of micrometeorites are falling to Earth every year. Um, but as of now, it's still meteorites where we get most of our um, information from. Uh, there are two fundamental types of meteorites, chondrites, which are more common and are aggregates of solar, solar nebula dust grains, and achondrites, which are derived from larger asteroids that got so big and so hot in their lifetime that they um, underwent partial or complete planetary differentiation processes, uh, such as core formation and crustal evolution. This group also encompasses meteorites from the Moon and Mars. Um, as remnants of the protoplanetary disk, meteorites are windows into the solar system's earliest history. They're sort of uh, time capsules that record in their compositions the initial conditions of and um, any thermal or chemical processing that occurred in the protoplanetary disk. And they record what kinds of material accreted to form their parent bodies. In the case of achondrites too, they record any igneous processes that occurred on the parent body, such as core formation and crustal development. It works. Um, here at the museum, we have one of the world's largest and ever growing collections of meteorites. Uh, the collection started with about 170 um, as part of the natural history exhibit at the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. Um, and has since grown to about 15,000 individual specimens of about 1,500 different meteorites. Um, it's really an invaluable resource for us in cosmochemistry. Um, now to circle back to uh, the skeptical child and their question, um, why do we do any of this? Uh, everyone has their own niche and their own um, real set of really pointed questions that they're trying to answer, but um, I guess for the most part, we're all working towards developing clear answers to five overarching questions. Those being, um, where did solar system matter come from? And what are the genetic relationships among solar system objects? Can we track the chemical evolution of differentiated bodies? Can we constrain the composition, evolution, and relative abundances of the components that accreted to form the earth? What led to the rise of life on earth? And how can we use all of this information to guide future space exploration? 
Um, now, the same skeptical child uh, who asked me why I do any of this also asked me how I know any of what I know. Um, again, <laughs> great, great question. She's going to make a really, really rigorous scientist one day. Um, basically, cosmochemistry utilizes many analytical methods, both destructive and non-destructive, both sample-based and remote, um, either telescopic or, or craft-based. And they all really need to be used in conjunction to get the most science out of precious samples um, and expensive missions. So continuing to find ways of combining methods is really how we're gonna build an ever clearer picture of solar system evolution. Some of the non-destructive analytical methods we use um, include orbital data, such as um, that obtained by the Dawn mission launched by NASA in 2012, I believe. Um, it circled the asteroid Vesta for about a year and gathered information about its uh, surface composition and topography. Um, and then once we have samples in our hands, um, we can study their mineralogical and petrologic assemblages using non-destructive um, or minimally destructive techniques, um, such as microscopy, spectroscopy, um, X-ray tomography and fluorescence, scanning electron imaging and chemical analysis and Raman spectroscopy. These techniques offer context for data later obtained with destructive techniques. Um, these are ones that require partial consumption of specimens um, because studying their elemental and isotopic compositions often require cutting, grinding, homogenization of a sample into a powder. Um, yeah, pretty destructive. Um, so I have elemental composition and isotopic composition up here as, as the destructive techniques. The behavior of elements um, in space is largely governed by their volatility, which we quantify by specifying the temperature or the temperature range at which elements change state from a gas to a solid during condensation. And so elemental compositions can tell us about the conditions under which a solid formed and where in the solar system, uh, how far from the sun uh, it, it formed. And the electrical properties of elements also control their behavior once they've accreted into parent bodies, uh, how they combine into minerals, how they dissolve in fluids, how they concentrate in magmas during melting. Um, and I wanna concentrate on the measurement of isotopic compositions in particular, because this is where most of my studies uh, have, have been uh, over the past few years. Um, the state of cosmochemistry is where it is right now, in large part due to the development of isotopic cosmochemistry um, and its essential tool, the mass spectrometer. The determination of isotopic properties of extraterrestrial materials and their components has provided the most exciting uh, advances in the field and the tightest constraints on the theory I spoke about before. Isotope cosmochemistry takes advantage of the fact that most elements have more than one isotope. Isotopes are just versions of the same element that have the same number of protons. This is what makes them the same element, but different numbers of neutrons. These isotopes can separate or what we call fractionate um, from each other or within or among phases in a rock or between a rock and its surroundings uh, due to chemical or physical processes that occur, for example, um, during planet formation, during planetary differentiation. And these can lead to measurable variations in the natural proportion of one isotope to another. Mass dependent fractionation in the upper left there indicates that the amount of separation scales with the difference in mass between one isotope and a reference isotope. And here I have the isotopes of calcium as, as an example. The variations are not large. Um, generally, we're talking about up to several parts per thousand. Um, so they require pretty, um, pretty intense analytical techniques. Some meteorites also record variable non-mass dependent isotopic compositions. These are the so-called nucleosynthetic anomalies. Um, and these correspond to isotopic signatures inherited from previous generations of stars. Only chondrites do this as opposed to achondrites. Uh, because they preserve the discrete meteorite components that formed in the disk prior to the accretion of the parent body, and because these components were heterogeneously distributed in the protoplanetary disk. 
There are also, and we won't talk about this today, there are also unstable or radioactive isotopes uh, for the, and their decay products, which can constrain element sources um, and permit the dating of rocks and events. My own work so far has concentrated on measuring mass dependent stable isotope variations in meteorites and also mission collected samples. Um, and this involves, again, the crushing and homogenizing of bulk samples into a fine powder, um, fully dissolving the powder in a combination of strong acids, generally hydrofluoric, hydrochloric, and nitric, um, and then running the dissolved samples through a set of resin filled columns using acids, um, the types, strengths, and timings of which have been carefully calibrated um, to isolate an element of choice, in my case, usually calcium. I then take the purified sample and, and measure its isotopic composition using a multi-collector mass spectrometer, which separates the sample's isotopes based on their masses and charges, and then reports the data as isotopic ratios. And I promise this is the only plot I'll show in this talk and kind of the end of the science heavy portion of this. Um, but basically by measuring isotopes on the mass spectrometer like this, you can build data sets um, for example, we have the calcium 44 to calcium 40 ratio in bulk earth. That's the center line. Um, and you can compare that to chondrites and achondrites. <clears throat> um, I have all, all types of chondrites and achondrites up here, as well as the moon and Mars. And this is just a simple way of visualizing similarities and differences between extraterrestrial materials and to help us draw conclusions that help answer the primary cosmochemical questions. Okay, and the science portion. Um, building increasingly comprehensive models of solar system evolution benefits not only from analytical advancements like isotope cosmochemistry, but also on expanding the number of meteorites that we have available for us. More samples means more information. And so in December, I set out on a month long meteorite hunting expedition in Antarctica with an international team. And this is because Antarctica is the world's premier hunting ground for meteorites for two main reasons. Um, one, although meteorites fall in a random fashion all over the globe, um, the likelihood of finding a meteorite against a plain background like snow or ice uh, or sand in the case of the Sahara is enhanced. And um, consequently, the Antarctic ice sheets, um, which are essentially a desert of ice, provide an ideal background. <clears throat> um, equally important is that the geography and the weather conditions of Antarctica can create concentrations of meteorites. Firstly, there are really strong catabatic winds uh, that concentrate meteorites in topographical de depressions like valleys or at the or in moraines. And also importantly, we get the formation of meteorite stranding zones. Um, when meteorites fall onto the ice or snow, they eventually sink in and are covered in snowpack. And as the Antarctic ice sheets move towards the coast, uh, their flow towards the margins is occasionally blocked by mountains or other interferences under the ice. And this pushes the meteorites that are under the ice back to the surface. Um, there's very little outflow and consistent snow inflow. And so you get these, these meteorite stranding zones where occasionally you have uh, tens or hundreds of meteorites per kilometer. And this is why, um, although Antarctica makes up only 9% of the world's land surface area, over 60% of meteorite finds have been made in Antarctica. That's about 45,000 meteorites to date. Uh, international collaboration is really at the heart of uh, not only the continent's governance, but um, in the expeditions themselves and in the cutting edge science that happens there. And uh, this particular expedition was a Belgian one, um, a joint effort between the French and Dutch speaking universities of Brussels um, and the Belgian International Polar Foundation, which is based in Cape Town. The Belgians actually have quite a long history in Antarctica. Um, there was the Belgian Antarctic expedition of 1897 to 1899. Um, it was the first one to overwinter in Antarctica. Uh, it was led by Adrien de Gerlache, pictured here. Um, and it's considered the first expedition of the sort of golden age of Antarctic um, exploration. 
Now, unfortunately, the Belgica, the ship, um, was really poorly equipped, uh, didn't have enough winter clothing for every man on board, not enough food, everyone had scurvy, um, so and it was polar night for much of it. So, uh, and to make matters worse, they were all trapped in ice about seven feet thick, uh, about halfway through and couldn't move the ship. Finally, after a few months, they managed to slowly make their way down a channel that they had cleared with dynamite. Um, it took them about a month to move seven miles. Uh, and eventually they did what they had to do, uh, gathered data and made it back to Antwerp in 1899. Luckily, since then, uh, technology has improved a lot. Situations are a lot less risky. We're much better equipped and uh, our mission took place from mid-December until mid-January, and it took us to the Belgian Princess Elizabeth Station, pictured here, which is uh, anchored on a granite ridge uh, of Utstein and Nunatak at an altitude of about almost 1,400 meters in the Droning Modland region of East Antarctica. Uh, the research station, which is it's about 220 kilometers, maybe like 120 miles um, from the Antarctic coast, Northeast Antarctic coast, is an ideal logistics hub for field exp exploration in the Northeast of Antarctica. It's also a really good gateway to the Sorondana Mountains and to glaciers and the Antarctic Plateau, great places to find meteorites. And so thanks to this uh, unique location, we, uh, won't, we didn't need to travel far into, uh, into the Antarctic wilderness to conduct our studies. The station is kind of the, the brainchild of this Belgian rogue polar explorer, um, Alain Hubert, pictured here uh, on top in the yellow. Uh, he's the founder and president of the International Polar Foundation. With the support of private donors, uh, he built and financed the construction of Princess Elizabeth in 2007. He became famous in the 90s for being the first Belgian to ever reach the North Pole and for setting a world record uh, for the longest crossing of the Antarctic continent. 99 days in 1998. Um, now I call him rogue because <laughs> he did cause some controversy in 2017 when uh, the Belgian state accused him of conflicts of interest, of uh, misusing funds, of being careless with bureaucracy, um, being a little too adventurous with, with the money there. And so the Belgian state forbade him um, from accessing the station. And as a reaction, he went there anyway um, and refused uh, to supply any scientific missions that year. So Belgium couldn't uh, do any science for, for a little while. A bit of a mess, it's been cleared up now and uh, he was very welcoming of us this year. The us being the 2022-2023 Belaray team, Belgian Antarctic Research Expedition team, composed of Vincent Dubai from the University of Brussels, the French speaking one, where I did my PhD. Uh, Maria Schoenbachler from ETH Zurich. We called each other the other Maria the whole trip. Um, and actually, as of a few days ago, Dr. Ryoga Maeda, uh, he's a joint grad student between the French and Dutch speaking universities of Brussels, and myself. After uh, almost a week in Cape Town, just to go over logistical, and cargo procedures, and of course, to visit Boulder's Beach to see one of the African continent's only penguin colonies. Um, and also this guy, if anyone in mammals wants to help me out, I don't know what this is. There you go. <laughs> he's, he's great, he's great. We also, of course, made sure to visit the Cape of Good Hope to have one of the worst hair days of our lives. Uh, we wanted to climb Table Mountain, but the, uh, the clouds were very, unpredictable there. And, and when there are even a few clouds, they cancel all trips to the top. The Antarctic Logistic Centre International organized and performed all flight missions, but getting to the final destination was uh, expectedly a bit tricky. It involved first a six hour flight on an Ilyushin 76, an old Russian gutted cargo jet. Um, didn't feel super safe. Um, that took us from Cape Town to Novo uh, Station in Antarctica. And after a short layover, about, it took about an hour and a half long flight on a Bastler utility aircraft to the Perseus Belgian airstrip. And then the final transport was overland with the, fir with the world's first solar powered electric vehicle specifically made for Antarctic uh, temperatures. So quite the process. 
On arrival, we got a tour of the facilities, the vehicles, the scientific mobile laboratories, um, and the power generation facilities. And we were allocated dorm rooms. Uh, this is the one I shared with Maria Schoenbachler, the other Maria. Uh, I got top bunk, of course, because it's more fun. Um, <laughs> quite an exercise trying not to keep each other awake with our snoring. You can see how small that room is. Um, now what's really cool about the Princess Elizabeth station um, is that it's the world's first zero emissions research station. Solar panels cover most of it. Um, the panels feed the smart grid with electricity. Any excess production is stored in batteries. There are also wind turbines to harness the massive catabatic wind energy. Uh, they're designed to withstand really, really intense storms. And there are also thermal solar panels used to melt the snow and uh, heat the water to be used in the station's bathrooms and our kitchen. The building is actually so well insulated that no heating has to be used. Um, and so it's, just, it's classified as a passive building. There are also bioreactors that use microorganisms to neutralize uh, wastewater and then it's reused. So. Feet of engineering. We underwent a few days of basic training, including uh, skidoo driving and maintenance, uh, crevasse rescue, first aid, hypothermia reversal, uh, CPR. Uh, incidentally, being in a crevasse is awesome, <laughs> but, but only in, <laughs> of course, only in a controlled situation, right? Only because I knew I was being rescued. But it's, it's beautiful down there. It's, it's completely quiet, um, just lovely. Uh, and this is us having mastered the art of the skidoo. Incidentally, this is the first vehicle I've driven in five years. I hate driving, but uh, I really love skidoos now. Uh, after three days, we packed our sleds and drove about three and a half hours to the spot chosen for base camp, uh, an area called Nils Larsen Fillet. We set up our tents and began the meteorite search the next day. Um, so where we decided to search wasn't random. Um, to aid in the planning of the expedition, to help us decide exactly where to conduct our searches, we used the results from last year's paper by Tolinar et al, describing the use of machine learning to create a probability index, a treasure map, uh, if you will, for Antarctic meteorites. Their analyses showed that we can predict meteorite rich areas using observations on surface temperature, ice flow velocities, surface cover types through um, radar observations uh, and surface geometry. Uh, these four factors need to combine favorably uh, to locate meteorites. There's generally always been a human factor in deciding where to go and search for meteorites, but it's, it's just not possible to evaluate um, the potential of an entire continent, especially one this big, uh, by relying solely on human judgment. So based on machine learning output, um, we can see where the likeliest places uh, to find meteorites are, ranging from a few square kilometers uh, to hundreds of square kilometers. And some of these places have already been ex explored, others have not. Um, many of those are close to Princess Elizabeth. So Tolinar's calculations suggest that more than 300,000 meteorites are, are still present at the surface uh, of the ice sheet. So by visiting these locations, investigating the potential uh, for using new recovery techniques um, in the field, this might represent a shift in how Antarctic meteorite recovery missions are conducted. For the next few days, we perform searches of moraines north and south of base camp in blue ice fields. Um, that's in the, in the green box. These searches were performed on foot with the team members spaced about 10 to 20 feet apart from each other um, in a line. And we did systematic sweeps back and forth uh, within a given area um, to find meteorites. However, no meteorite yields uh, were, were found. Um, there were plenty of meteor wrongs, uh, dark colored rocks that because of their color and texture kind of fooled us into thinking they were meteorites until we, we examined them more closely. And actually we saw a lot of rocks in the process of disappearing into the ice. These are called cryokonites. 
Um, it's where rocks absorb heat from the sun and then re-radiate this heat to their surroundings, um, causing the rock to sink into the, into the ice or snow. We expect to see this for dark colored rocks, but we actually saw them around a lot of light colored rocks too, um, and even around silt patches. Uh, we saw a lot of liquid water um, and perhaps rocks sinking into the ice at a faster rate than expected, <clears throat> perhaps occluding meteorites. So by Christmas Eve, I won't lie, uh, this is pretty depressing that we hadn't found anything. Um, so we made ourselves feel better with some cheese fondue and a, a gift exchange. I will note, I didn't get the gift exchange memo, so I spent the next day writing limericks about everyone as a gift. But on Christmas day, we decided to carry out a search in a blue ice field that was dilute enough with rocks that doing it by snowmobile was actually more efficient. So we drove very slowly in an arrow formation with the, the polar field guide at the front and two people on either side. Um, after, sev after several hours of driving five to 10 kilometers an hour, we happened upon a single <laughs> small dark brown rock with a black fusion crust. It was about 170 grams. Um, Valsian performed a magnetic susceptibility test right there in the field with a pocket size instrument meant for this. Um, and it indicated that we were looking at a meteorite. Throughout the day, we'd find two more, each about 30 grams. Uh, we collected the meteorites in plastic bags, avoiding direct contact. We gave them a provisional name, uh, wrote the name directly on the ice with a special marker. GPS locations were taken. Yeah, it was a Christmas miracle. That's great. The next day we explored the moraine of an ice tongue. Um, an ice tongue is essentially a floating platform of ice attached to the front of a glacier that extrudes into a basin. The weather was so perfect that I took off most of my coats um, and my gloves. We enjoyed a long lunch break, um, just kind of sat around. And the terrain, although it proved very difficult, uh, a difficult one on which to search for meteorites, just because everything was dark and there were just so many rocks, um, we did manage to find another small one, again, about 30 grams just as we were leaving. After that find, we packed up and spent the next five days back at the station because the weather was getting really bad, certainly too bad for, for field work. Um, the snow drift caused by high winds actually caused a 10 foot pileup of snow in front of the station's main door, which we spent a couple of days digging ourselves out of. Um, yeah, visibility was so low that, that it was deemed whiteout conditions, really, really poor conditions to go meteorite searching in. When it cleared up, we spent the next four days around the Nansen Blue Ice Field, about 60 kilometers, 37 miles south of Princess Elizabeth Station. We looked at areas called, pardon my Norwegian, Verheyenfjelle, the aligned nunataks and the Roisha nunatak. Uh, one of those days we spent just collecting sediments on a mountaintop to look for possible micrometeorites using uh, a very high-tech dustpan and broom, as you can see. Uh, and then we brought these sediments back to the, the mobile laboratories and sifted them um, for anything less than two millimeters in diameter and, and making aliquots for each team member. But the weather got rough again. Uh, it seemed colder than usual. The terrain was really difficult. These are sestrugis, which are um, hardened snow dunes. And uh, there's a lot of wind, very cold, low visibility. This is a high visibility day, but for the most part, you couldn't tell the difference between the sky and the ground. And to make matters worse, I fell off my snowmobile and injured my shoulder. <laughs> but then in what was to be the last hour, of the last day of our search, we stumbled across an enormous brown stone sitting by itself in the middle of an ice field. Um, it was a little bit smaller than a bowling ball, but about twice as heavy, about 17 pounds. And it had the telltale fusion crust that we look for on a meteorite, although some had begun to, begun to weather away. And when we performed a magnetic susceptibility test on it in the field, it indicated that we were looking at a chondrite, probably an H chondrite. 
Uh, the field guide stood by as the rest of us took pictures with it as if it were a celebrity. Um, and, and actually at about 17 pounds, it, it does put it in the top 100 heaviest meteorites ever found in Antarctica. So we were extremely excited. We felt vindicated. Uh, this is a major success for us, especially it being the last hour of the last day. The recovered meteorites were first kept in the food freezer at the station, so as not to melt any of the snow that was on the surface and risk any liquid water seeping into any cracks and altering the, the minerals in there. Um, and then it was transported in a frozen state to the Royal Belgian Institute of Natural Sciences in Brussels um, to be thawed in vacuum conditions and then classified. And it remains there at the moment, though I'd love to bring it here at some point. So what am I doing? In the meantime, um, I'm going through all of the sediments that I brought back, brought about 10 pounds of it. Uh, and I have an intern going through, he's on bag one of 25 um, and he's found about a dozen so far. So that's pretty cool. I like micrometeorites because um, there are 47,000 tons of them fall to earth every year, much more than meteorites. And so they provide an unparalleled sample set for studying chemical variation in the solar system. And because there are, there's so much material compared to meteorites, they may have information in them that's different from or complementary to meteorites or even sample parent bodies that we haven't, haven't sampled yet with meteorites. So what did I learn in Antarctica? Um, I think we were initially a little disappointed at coming back with only five meteorites. Granted, one was very big. Um, but when you remember that this was sort of um, a pioneering mission uh, to search areas that hadn't been searched yet and to explore the potential of new meteorite stranding zones, I'm pleased. Uh, I think my main takeaway from this is that machine learning is very useful, but perhaps only to a first order. Um, and actual visits to predicted accumulation zones are still necessary because a lot of local factors come into play. You have topography, wind direction, perhaps the loss of meteorites to cryokonites, this complicates things. And so we still, at this time, need both. Um, I wanted to tie this back to Women's History Month in some way. Uh, I talked about how meteorites record in their chemistries uh, the imprints of different stellar sources into the molecular cloud. The chemical and isotopic compositions may change over time, due to nebular and planetary processes, but it's really one of our main jobs as cosmochemists to try to know what it looked like initially and to know what makes us all up. And in this field, you can spend a lot of time in your own head, uh, sort of contemplating the origins of everything, the recycling of all material, the fact that we're all stardust. Um, and so you end up with existential thoughts, like if I were a solar system, unto myself, um, born out of a molecular cloud with different stellar inputs, how would that translate? What would that look like? I was also re really inspired by Jing Mei's talk a few weeks ago, um, where she talked about the foundation uh, provided to her by um, strong women relatives uh, that came before her. And I thought about the strong women in my own family, stellar inputs, if you will, uh, who provided me the molecular cloud with the life I have now. So uh, here we have two stellar inputs, my great grandparents, uh, both immigrants to the country from Leipzig, Germany, and from Havana. My great grandparents are the rightmost woman and the man in the white suit. Uh, they came to the US in the 1920s um, as, as immigrants to Brooklyn. Uh, my German grandparents didn't know each other. My grandmother, great grandmother came here by herself um, and they met each other in Niagara Falls actually. After that, my, my grandmother on my father's side um, grew up in New York while my grandmother on my mother's side was growing up in Japan. Um, they were Korean. They were a Korean family that owned a restaurant in Kyushu. They moved to Japan um, before World War II. And then when war broke out, they moved back to Korea. And my grandma, before the move, 
was uh, acting as a rice smuggler from, uh, from Korea. She was small and unsuspecting. And so they, they strapped rice around her um, and made her look like a chubby kid bringing rice into uh, Yokohama for their restaurant. Then when war broke out, they moved back to Korea just in time for the Korean War, right? Um, and they, they landed in Busan. Uh, my grandma had my mother with um, an American GI stationed in Korea. Um, great for my mother to have been born into this world, but in Korea at the time, um, pretty poor conditions for mixed race children. She's in the center in the yellow and you can see how white she looks. Um, it was a pretty bad life for anyone half white there. Um, her friends there are also um, half white and, uh, and they stuck together. So when she was 17, she decided to leave Korea because even though she was educated, uh, the fact that she was half white meant probably pretty poor um, uh, work uh, available for her. And so at 17, she left by herself, moved to the US and started a new life. Um, and so that's my molecular cloud. Those are the strong women that, uh, that had inputs into who I am today. Um, just like our actual solar system's molecular cloud, it has such a variety of stellar inputs. As you can see, in my case, it's led to such interesting uh, situations such as the middle picture where no one in that picture is actually fully Korean or in my father's case, Korean at all. Yet here we are decked out in full Korean garb. Um, and, and in the second picture where I am with my um, Korean and German grandmothers. And that's what made me who I am today. So uh, it's taken me on a, a lot of cool adventures. And if anyone wants to ask any questions about it, please do. Oh, hi. Um, I have a microphone. Um, okay, so I have uh, kind of two questions. Um, I think the first one is like, I'm very curious to like hear kind of your more perspective on overcoming the fear of cold, because for me, at least from my perspective, like the Antarctic as an environment is possibly quite possibly like what one of the most extreme environments on the earth. And it's it's been romanticized in many ways. Like you were kind of talking about the golden age of exploring but there's still, you know, a risk of that. How, how, what was your pro like mental process for preparing for that um, and going into these extreme circumstances to do your scientific work? And then, um, yeah, just like I, I'm, I, I was very interested into the part about um, the integration of AI into your studies and where do you see that going in the next five, 10 years of like, do you think that over time, what the president you sent with your mission, how do you think that's gonna evolve? Okay, loaded questions. Um, I, I will say before this, I had done zero field work. Um, I was a lab rat through and through. Uh, and so to go from zero to 100 really fast freaked me out for a, a good like year before this expedition started. Uh, I was really scared, especially of the cold. Um, if I had gone there with what I was equipped with myself, uh, I, I would not have uh, survived. But when we were in Cape Town, we, we stopped at the um, International Polar Foundation to borrow polar clothing. And, you know, we took more coats than we needed, layers of everything. We were, we were really, really prepared. Um, and I will say that with all of the layers on, you didn't really experience the cold too much. Uh, there were moments where like, as this was primarily like, it was like a mostly women trip, uh, if you had to pee out in the field, you did have to take everything off to pee in the field. So for a brief, <laughs> brief few moments, you were like naked on the ice. But other than that, you're pretty comfortable unless you spent 10, 12 hours out there. And on some days, it was actually colder in Chicago <laughs> than it was <laughs> in Antarctica. Um, I, I had occasional contact with people back here. And I know that around Christmas time, it was like minus 20 or 30 degrees there. Uh, whereas only my five or 10 there. So uh, it, it was doable. You kind of just have to do it <laughs> uh, to get over it. And then uh, in regards to AI, 
uh, it's very new. It's very new. This paper just came out last year. And so I think using AI to predict where meteorites are is still um, really fresh. Clearly, clearly there are some issues that haven't been taken into account yet. Um, the model does not account for things like cryokinites, changing temperatures, um, you know, wind direction, wind speed, things like that. And so it definitely needs to be refined within the next five or 10 years. Hopefully we can use it more and more to, to inform our missions. Great talk, Maria. Uh, I have a question. So, what's the like uh, the, the the so so you showed how meteorites they you know they they, they go under the ice and then they come back. Uh, how long is this process? So, like, if you go to an area that you explored already, how long do you have to wait? Thousands of years to explore it again, or hundreds of years? Like, how long is this process? Yeah. Um. So, I think this question would be better directed towards like a, a glaciologist who studies glacier movements, but my impression is that it takes thousands of years for this to happen. Yeah, I guess it depends um, how quickly the ice sheet comes across an interference below it. Um, if it's in an area with more interferences, perhaps more quickly, but yeah, it could take thousands of years. Hi, back here. <laughs> uh, great talk. And I'm just curious, how are the Antarctica meteorites officially named, especially related that they can shift uh, and be found several miles from where they actually fell? I, I remember sure. you mentioned the, the provisional name, so I'm just curious. Right, yeah, the provisional names are just, you know, our initial and the date it was found or whatever. Generally, meteorites are named for where they're found, um, sometimes for where they fell, if we know where they fell, but sometimes we don't know when. Um, and so in Antarctica, most are named after the station that they're closest to. Uh, I think ours are going to be named Asuka one, two, three, four, five, because they were located most closely to the Japanese Asuka station, which, which doesn't function anymore, but it, where it used to be, I think they'll be called Asuka. Yeah. Hi, you mentioned that this was your first, um, field work that you've done, do you hope to do more in the future then? Oh my God, if I was invited back, I would definitely go. <laughs> um, as I said, I was really scared about field work, really scared. Uh, but now that I know what it entails, I know that I can do it. Uh, I would absolutely go again and, and maybe tailor the experience this time with what I've learned. I have two questions. Um, I just recently watched a documentary about Shackleton, who was one of these, um, you know, people who in the, the great golden age of polar exploration. And um, I was surprised to learn that he was not particularly motivated by the scientific <laughs> aspect of his yeah. voyage. And I was just curious if those, um, those trips actually had any scientific significance, if we learned much from them. And then my second question was just, I was curious as to, um, what was the working language since you're on a Belgian expedition of your team? Right. Um, so it's true. Shackleton kind of just went uh, because he enjoyed <laughs> the, the excursion um, and he had a terrible trip. It was, it was 18 or 19 months of, of his men absolutely freezing, of ships getting wrecked, of, of being completely lost but in the end, saving all of his men. And I'll say, I'll never complain about being cold again because these men existed for 18 months in basically just wool sweaters. Um, he, I would say his, his main scientific, or our main scientific takeaway from Shackleton's expedition is the opening up of new ge geographical areas, areas that hadn't been explored before. So he didn't bring back any samples. He didn't make any measurements, but he explored new areas that we went back to later. Um, and then the, the working language um, in our group was, was English, but at the station, uh, if, if you know anything about French speakers, if there are more than two in a room, um, even if there are a hundred of you, uh, the working language becomes French. So uh, it, it was a bit tough. Um, sometimes they thought I didn't understand, uh, but I did. <laughs> so um, yeah, a bit of a sort of cold war between the French speakers and English speakers at the base. That was a great talk, Maria. Thanks. Um, 
can you talk so I on that machine learning map that you showed um is there much exploration happening along the other side of the continent and yeah. does it is it determined by whether there are facilities there and who's able to arrange to do field work at this facility or that facility yeah essentially um the the center of Antarctica kind of remains um pretty unexplored although when we were there this Norwegian woman was was on the same flight, um, getting ready to be the first Norwegian woman to hike from near the Belgian station to the South Pole by herself. So that was interesting. But generally, uh, most expeditions happen coastally, and that's just because ease of access and everything. Um, on the west, trying to get back to it, on the west of Antarctica, you have the American station, McMurdo, sort of in the Southwest. You have Indian, German, English stations. The English one's actually on wheels. They can just move it wherever they want to. Um, yeah, uh, and, and more and more countries are developing uh, stations, but again, mostly coastally. Thank you. Do you have another? These are still your questions. Um, do you have a nickname for the big rock? We and, <laughs> <laughs> number one. And then um, I, I have a, a friend, Kyle, who worked at, um, like studied black holes. I think in the Mercurio thing, and they had like this weird tradition of like adding an artifact to the basement of the facility every year. What were some weird traditions that were just happened at the facility? Hmm. Um, let's see. Okay. Well, we did call the meteorite big boy for a while. Um, again, this is provisional to the provisional name. Uh, and then, okay. Weird, weird, uh, weird. Uh, I mean, we had dance parties, uh, at the station. Um, it was 24 hour daylight at the station. So kind of an awkward daylight dance party, unless we went to the roof and covered up the skylights with blankets to simulate night. Um, that, that was fun. That was a good tradition. Uh, what else? I don't know. You know, there's probably a lot that would come to mind if I wasn't put on the spot right now. Thank you. Is there any on Zoom by chance too? Are you looking on the Zoom? Well, I Hi, thank you so much. Um, so I come from an archeological background. So. I guess my questions are, um, how does permitting work <laughs> in Antarctica? I'm kind of curious about that. And also about like, is there any potential for like excavating in these areas where you know that you find meteorites? Would you ever be able to excavate in that kind of condition? Thank you. Um, these, are, these are good questions and ones I, ha I haven't considered. I guess people don't excavate for meteorites because they know they'll come up to the surface at some point and there's so much unexplored territory that you might as well just go to areas where they've already been revealed to the surface again. So I'm not sure about excavation. Um, I'm also not too sure about permitting. Um, you know, some countries do have really strong permits or exportation issues with their meteorites. For example, like Algeria and Morocco have really strong exportation policies. But I'm pretty sure that uh, as long as you can get yourself on a trip to Antarctica with a sanctioned team uh, and, and you find the meteorite within those bounds, uh, I'm pretty sure it's just available to you for, for science. Um, I could be wrong, but I, I'm pretty sure that's, that's it. it's in, internationally governed and that's how the meteorite exportation works as well. Okay, we do have a question from Zoom. What was the medical care like at the station? Um, there, we had a live-in doctor, Jen, who uh, for the most part, just kind of hung around until I injured myself <laughs> and uh, also had a bout of vertigo there. Then she had plenty of work, um, but there, there's a full doctor's office at the station. Um, and then our field guide is also a, a trained medic. So if anything happened when we were three and a half hours away from the base camp, uh, he would also be there to, to do, to administer any emergency services. Thank you so much. Does anybody have maybe one more question? Okay. Thank you so much, Maria. Thank you all for coming.